Hello listeners, and welcome back to Sandman Stories Presents. Today we have another story from Lafcadi O'Hearn. This comes from the book of Quaidan, Stories and Studies of Strange Things. This story is about a ghostly spirit that spares a man's life, but only if he promises never to speak about what happened that night. What happens in Musashi stays in Musashi. Okay, let's begin. Yuki Ona In a village of Musashi province, there lived two woodcutters, Mosaku and Minokichi. At the time of which I am speaking, Mosaku was an old man, and Minokichi, his apprentice, was a lad of 18 years. Every day they went together to a forest situated about five miles from their village. On the way to that forest, there is a wide river to cross, and there is a ferry boat. Several times a bridge was built where the ferry is, but the bridge was each time carried away by a flood. No common bridge can resist the current there when the river rises. Mosaku and Minokichi were on their way home one very cold evening, when a great snowstorm overtook them. They reached the ferry, and they found that the boatman had gone away, leaving his boat on the other side of the river. It was no day for swimming, and the woodcutters took shelter in the ferryman's hut, thinking themselves very lucky to find any shelter at all. There was no brazier in the hut, nor any place in which to make a fire. It was only a two-mat hut with a single door, but no window. Mosaku and Minokichi fastened the door, and lay down to rest, with their straw raincoats over them. At first they did not feel very cold, and they thought that the storm would soon be over. The old man almost immediately fell asleep, but the boy, Minokichi, lay awake for a long time, listening to the awful wind and the continual slashing of the snow against the door. The river was roaring, and the hut swayed and creaked like a junk at sea. It was a terrible storm, and the air was every moment becoming colder, and Minokichi shivered under his raincoat. But at last, in spite of the cold, he too fell asleep. He was awakened by a showering of snow in his face. The door of the hut had been forced open, and by the snow light, Yuki Akiri, he saw a woman in the room, a woman all in white. She was bending above Musaku and blowing her breath upon him, and her breath was almost like a bright white smoke. Almost in the same moment, she turned to Minokichi and stooped over him. He tried to cry out, but found that he could not utter any sound. The white woman bent down over him, lower and lower, until her face almost touched him, and he saw that she was very beautiful, though her eyes made him afraid. For a time she continued to look at him. Then she smiled and she whispered, I intended to treat you like the other man, but I cannot help feeling some pity for you, because you are so young. You are a pretty boy, Minokichi and I will not hurt you now. But if you ever tell anybody, even your own mother, about what you have seen this night, I shall know it, and then I will kill you. Remember what I say. With these words she turned from him and passed through the doorway. Then he found himself able to move and he sprang up and looked out. But the woman was nowhere to be seen, and the snow was driving furiously into the hut. Minokichi closed the door and secured it by fixing several billets of wood against it. He wondered if the wind had blown it open. He thought that he might have only been dreaming, and might have mistaken the gleam of the snow light in the doorway for a figure of a white woman, but he could not be sure. He called to Musaku, and was frightened because the old man did not answer. He put out his hand to the dark and touched Mosaku's face, and found that it was ice. Mosaku was stark and dead. By dawn the storm was over, and when the ferryman returned to his station a little after sunrise, he found Minokichi lying senseless beside the frozen body of Mosaku. 
Minokichi was properly cared for and soon came to himself, but he remained a long time ill from the effects of the cold on that terrible night. He had been greatly frightened by the old man's death, but he said nothing about the vision of the woman in white. As soon as he got well again, he returned to his calling, going alone every morning to the forest and coming back at nightfall with his bundles of wood, which his mother helped him to sell. One evening in the winter of the following year, as he was on his way home, he overtook a girl who happened to be traveling by the same road. She was a tall, slim girl and very good-looking, and she answered Minokichi's greeting in a voice as pleasant to the ear as the voice of a songbird. Then he walked beside her, and they began to talk. The girl said that her name was Oyuki, that she had lately lost both of her parents, and that she was going to Yedo, where she happened to have some poor relations, who might help her to find a situation as a maidservant. Minokichi soon felt charmed by this strange girl, and the more he looked at her, the more handsome she appeared to be. He asked her whether she was yet betrothed, and she answered laughingly that she was free. Then in her turn, she asked Minokichi whether he was married or pledged to marry, and he told her that, although he had only a widowed mother to support, the question of an honorable daughter-in-law had not yet been considered, as he was very young. After these confidences, they walked on for a long while without speaking. But, as the proverb declares, when the wish is there, the eyes can say as much as the mouth. By the time they reached the village, they had become very much pleased with each other, and then Minokichi asked Oyuki to rest a while at his house. After some shy hesitation, she went there with him, and his mother made her welcome, and she prepared a warm meal for her. Oyuki behaved so nicely that Minokichi's mother took a sudden fancy to her, and persuaded her to delay her journey to Yedo. And the natural end of the matter was that Yuki never went to Yedo at all. She remained in the house as an honorable daughter-in-law. Oyuki proved to be a very good daughter-in-law. When Minokichi's mother came to die some five years later, her last words were words of affection and praise for the wife of her son. And Oyuki bore Minokichi ten children, boys and girls, handsome children all of them, and a very fair skin. The country folk thought Oyuki was a wonderful person, by nature different from themselves. Most of the peasant women age early, but Oyuki, even after having become the mother of ten children, looked as young and fresh as on the day when she first came to the village. One night, after the children had gone to sleep, Oyuki was sewing by the light of the paper lamp, and Minokichi watching her said, To see you sewing there with the light on your face makes me think of a strange thing that happened when I was a lad of eighteen. I then saw somebody as beautiful and white as you are now. Indeed, she was very much like you. Without lifting her eyes from her work, Oyuki responded, Tell me about her. Where did you see her? Then Minokichi told her about the terrible night in the ferryman's hut, about the white woman that had stooped above him, smiling and whispering, and about the silent death of old Musaku. And he said, Asleep or awake, that was the only time I saw a being as beautiful as you. Of course, she was not a human being, and I was afraid of her, very much afraid. But she was so white. Indeed, I have never been sure whether it was a dream that I saw or the woman of the snow. Oyuki flung down her sewing and arose, and bowed above Minokichi where he sat, and shrieked into his face. It was I! Yuki it was! And I told you then that I would kill you if you ever said one word about it. But for those children asleep there, I would kill you this moment. And now, you had better take very, very good care of them. For if they ever have reason to complain of you, I will treat you as you deserve. Even as she screamed, her voice became thin like the crying of the wind. Then she melted into a bright white mist that spired to the roof beams and shuddered away through the smoke hold. Never was she seen again. The End
Okay, that was the spookiest version of Snow White that I've ever read. I love the personification of the winter coldness turning into a woman who steals the life force of humans. Every winter I feel a bit of my soul being eaten by the wind. My only hope is to retire someplace warm and winterless. I kind of saw the twist coming when he met Yuki walking by herself down the country road. It just didn't seem natural. Creepy, a beautiful story. And the podcast shoutout is to the Driving with Randy podcast. When I first started podcasting, there was a group of people who had been doing it for a minute and had their own very distinct styles and followings. We all talked and gave each other feedback on a Discord server, and it was super helpful for me finding out what I wanted to do. One of those shows was the Driving with Randy podcast, hosted by Road Rage Randy. I can guarantee Randy is not the Road Rage type. He podcasts from the car he currently has, and talks about life and adventures and trying new fruits and rollerblading runs. One of my favorite episodes is not even when he's driving, but a walk he took in the woods where he talked to himself and kind of got introspective. It was really nice. So if you like his podcast as much as I do, go and give him a rating and review on Podchaser, iTunes, Spotify, or Good Pods. And the listener shout-out is to Pleasantville, New Jersey. I think there's someone listening there from another podcast crew. I know Ladies' Fright Night is recorded from somewhere in Jersey, and I think we listen to each other's pods. It is located on the ancestral home of the Leni Lenape. I will attempt to speak their language. Also a big shout-out to Whose Land Am I On? a Canadian website that shows whose tribal lands different places are located. So, here's my best Lenin Lenape. Wanishi ok meioi kawi. Thank you, and go to sleep. <laughs>